everyone, and it's good to see you. Welcome to Crim2 News at Noon. I'm Brandon T. Jones, in for Laura today. And happening today, Spokane Valley is talking about hiring new police officers for their department. Nicole Hernandez has a look at the plant and how much it would cost. Yeah, so Spokane Valley City Council is talking about adding those new officers in their city council meeting tonight. The way it works is Spokane Valley partners with the Spokane County Sheriff's Office to have officers running the city. Right now, there are 91 people who work fully as Spokane Valley PD officers. Back at the end of 2022, the department hired a consulting group to come in and look at their workflow. They suggested Spokane Valley PD should add 25 new officers. Of the 25, 10 would be patrol officers and 7 would be investigators. Adding these officers would cost the city more than $6 million, but the department says the city needs it. In the last 15 years, Spokane Valley's population has gone up by 20,000 people. In just the last five years, the amount of people calling the police department every year has gone up by 8,000. And that's not including crime check calls, that's just calls for service. Because of this, officer response times have been longer and officers have not had as much time to just patrol the community. Now, the ideal plan for the police department is to have all of these new officers working and in service by 2026. But for now, Spokane Valley City Council is just discussing this as an option. In Spokane Valley, Nicole Hernandez, Crem2 News. Also happening today, Spokane Public Schools is hosting a meeting to talk about a bond and replacement levy. The levy would support several different services and programs, while the bond supports updating and improving school buildings. If either fail, it could impact schools across the city. Tonight's meeting is at Gary Middle School and from 515 to 615 in the library. And then if you can't make it, another meeting will be held at Chase Middle School on Thursday. A reminder, ballots are due in two weeks from today on February 13th. Now let's go ahead and check in with meteorologist Thomas Patrick because Thomas, this morning, honestly, on the drive into work, I felt like that was one of the foggiest drives I've had in a long time, but what's it looking like out there right now? Yeah, it's definitely felt like the winter of fog for Spokane, and I can replicate exactly what you just said, Brandon. It felt incredibly foggy early on this morning. Now the visibilities aren't all that low at the moment, but there's still a chill in the air. In fact, at 37 degrees, we have only climbed two degrees all morning long, and that's because this is the lingering impact of that temperature inversion, the colder, dense air that is settling in towards the ground, and you can feel it where those temperatures are in the 30s. Not so much in Pullman or Moscow, where it is 49 degrees just to our south by a couple dozen of miles, so that is a big time difference. At 37, our computer model is about five degrees off at the moment, so if we're five degrees colder than our expected high temperature for the day, I think that puts us closer to 44, 45 degrees for our expected highs. So you're going to see an update to my seven day forecast just for today to try to account for that lingering temperature inversion. The cloud cover above our heads is going to keep things probably a little bit more cool than initially anticipated. The visibilities are improving, but I don't think we're going to see a fully sunny day because these are the high level clouds that are now on top. So even though the sunshine would be shining through if the fog were gone, well, the clouds are going to eliminate any kind of threat of that. So coming up, just going to have the latest update to our temperature forecast for today because of the cloud cover, but how much longer the warmth does generally last until we get a cold front later on this week. Those details in just a few minutes. We'll be looking forward to that, Thomas. But for right now, a developing story on Capitol Hill. A House committee is set to advance two articles of impeachment against the Homeland Security Secretary today over his handling of the border crisis. Natalie Brand has the latest on their effort and why. The secretary says he's not bothered by it. You know, but we've reached a point where we really have no other remedy. The House Homeland Security Committee put pen to paper Tuesday morning, marking up two articles of impeachment against Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. He is the worst cabinet official in our nation's history, and he's got to go. House Republicans allege Mayorkas repeatedly violated the law by allowing the release of migrants awaiting court proceedings and claim he lied to lawmakers about whether the southern border was secure. Democrats call the proceedings a sham. In a process akin to throwing spaghetti at the wall, and seeing what sticks. Republicans have cooked up vague, unprecedented grounds 
to impeach Secretary Mayorkas. The GOP effort follows unprecedented border crossing levels in December, though numbers have since fallen. Secretary Mayorkas released a letter to the committee chair saying the, quote, false allegations do not rattle him, adding the department has provided evidence they are enforcing the law. House Speaker Mike Johnson intends to bring the issue up for a full vote, but an impeachment is unlikely to move forward in the Democratic-controlled Senate. Some House GOP members have also come out against a bipartisan Senate border security immigration proposal that Secretary Mayorkas has helped negotiate. This idea that he's now negotiating, uh, what was he doing for the last three years? The Senate could unveil that deal as soon as this week. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Capitol Hill. All right, and to give you an idea how rare this effort is, a U.S. cabinet official has not been impeached since shortly after the Civil War. And earlier today, Washington Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers took part in a congressional hearing about the dams on the Lower Snake River. She met with representatives from the Council on Environmental Quality, U.S. Department of Energy, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Bonneville Power Administration met in Washington, D.C. They talked about the Biden administration's plan to remove the dams on the Lower Snake River and its impact on the community.